Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise God. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 12. The Bible says, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Somebody say, I'm a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Say it again. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Say it one more time. Uh huh. Of the inheritance of the saints in light. Praise God. When the Bible says God has made us meet, it means he has made us worthy enough. He has qualified us. He has esteemed us to the account where we require to do nothing because he has done all that is necessary for us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the next verse says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him are all things consisting praise god and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning again again he has repeated it the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence somebody shout hallelujah in all things he has preeminence in art in all things he goes first to set the pace praise god he just then go first but he goes first to set the pace jesus is our standard praise god he sets the pace he does not limit it no he sets it there's no limitation with him he says greater things shall you do praise the lord jesus now today i'm going to speak a very deep word today not that the rest are not deep huh? praise god but it's going to be deep again today something so deep recently the lord has impressed upon my heart to to open our eyes to the blessing of god to the inheritance of the saints praise god what it means to for the inheritance of the saints he has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light the blessing of god that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow not only financially but in every way you're rich in wisdom you're rich in knowledge you're rich in strength you're rich in power in understanding somebody say i'm rich in all things he says the blessing of the lord it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it i am a blessed man somebody say i'm a blessed woman i'm a blessed man praise god confess it and say i'm a blessed one in the mighty name of jesus you see people call the manifestation of blessing the blessing but the blessing itself is not something you see physically what you see is the manifestation of the blessing praise god recently i was sharing somewhere on sunday on service and i said there are people who ask themselves questions like 
Why is it that I listen to the word, I pray, I do this, I go to apostles, I go to teachers, evangelists, even a prophet prophesied on me. But I don't see the blessing of God working in my life. You understand? There is nothing as frustrating as frustrated potential. It's okay if it's not in you. But it's disturbing if it is in you and it's not working. See, God doesn't ask for what you don't have. He gives seed to the soul and bread to the eater. Are you hearing me? Frustrated potential is a place where you walk feeling that what is inside you is way bigger than what you're seeing outside. And you don't see the process and working of life that takes you there. If you see where you're going, regardless of how slow you might endure. Some people admire where you are. And that is why you have gratitude to God that God thank you for the life that I have. Thank you for the health that I have. Because there's somebody right now in hospital struggling for a breath. They are dying the next minute. And there's nothing science or money can do. So wherever you are in life, you're going to always have an advantage above many people. But because you are of advantage, it does not mean that you are where you're supposed to be. Who has understood what I just said? It does not presuppose that you settle for where you are because you are way better than many people. Frustrated potential comes when you look at yourself, not because you don't have gratitude to God for what he has done, but even amidst the gratitude you have toward God, you still feel that there is an expectation that the heavens have on your life. God has branded you for a destiny way bigger than many people can see. And I have good news tonight. Some things are unlocking. In the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say I am meet. God has met me to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Praise God. Praise God. Now, if you will notice, when he was speaking, in the 15th verse, he speaks of Jesus as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the Bible says in the 18th verse again, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, comma, again he says, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. Now, God has said firstborn twice in just the space of three or four verses. And he still insists telling you, look, there is something about this firstborn or the mind of the firstborn that you and I need to understand to appreciate this inheritance and blessing that you and I have in God. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you talk about money, for example, if, for example, today I said you talk about the prosperity of the believer, not just by wealth, by health, by the soul, by the increase, by everything. If I talked about money, many people, not here today, have been deceived to think that being broke is divine, or that talking about the prosperity of God is seen and therefore you are a prosperity preacher. And sometimes I want to ask them and challenge their theology and ask them, who is a prosperity preacher? Oh, he's somebody, who, they always say, he's somebody who tells you, oh, God is going to make you prosperous. Wait a minute. Was Abraham broke? <laughs> Was Isaac broke? Was Jacob broke? Was Solomon broke? Was David broke? Was Jesus broke? Is Apostle Grace broke? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the problem is not the prosperity of the believer. The problem is the idol in the believer that has become prosperous. Because the idol in the believer takes the responsibility away from the believer of how much God has given them. Again, the Bible says, To whom much has been given, much is what? Required. We need money to feed orphans and widows. We need money to feed the sick and 
and learn nations. You understand what I'm saying? So the problem is not how much God has given you. The problem is the idol you build around you to make yourself a God over what you possess and forget the responsibility of servanthood and stewardship over what the Lord has given you. Praise the Lord. But it's okay to be rich. Somebody say it's okay to be rich. Even financially. And I don't plan to be poor. Tell your neighbor. On the left and the right. <laughs> Jesus. I, I don't, anger. No, I don't plan to be poor. No. In the mighty name of Jesus. Poverty is a spirit. It's a spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. But the Bible says he is the firstborn. Of every creature. He is the firstborn from among the dead. God is causing him to appear as one and indeed is the preeminence of all things. The one that comes first to set the pace and standard of the Christian life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now let me share a mystery with you. In the Hebrew, and I want you to understand this. From the Hebrew perspective. Because sometimes you need to get in the culture of the word to understand the intensity of every interpretation in the word. From the Hebrew culture, birthright is a very powerful element of culture in the Hebrew people. And this is not only derived in the Jewish culture. But it is derived in the relationship God has shared with man from ages past. Do you understand what I'm saying? Birthright is an issue. The rights the first born has. The rights the second born has. The rights children have. You understand what I'm saying? Even the Christ. When the Bible calls him the firstborn, God is trying to define a birthright issue. Because some people think that you can understand the blessing of God without understanding the birthright principle. That is not possible. That is why Jacob took the blessing of Esau. Why? Because before that, Esau sold his birthright. You understand? When he sold his birthright, it was inevitable. Spiritually, it was possible for the supplanter to take his blessing. And the irony of the supplanter to supplant without his name. Because when he comes before the father, he says, I'm Esau, your son. He didn't say, I'm Jacob, because Jacob means the supplanter. He did not take by who he was. He took by the birthright of who was going to be blessed. Who has understood what I just said? When Jacob walks in, he didn't say, I'm Jacob. I claim the birthright of Esau because he sold it to me for a morsel of meat. No. He came in and said, I'm Esau, your son. Because he knew that he could not come under the authority of Jacob. Even if he deserved the blessing because his brother had sold the birthright. He could not come in the power of Jacob, the supplanter. That's why I said it's an irony that the supplanter supplants without using his identity. But the identity of the one who has the right. Now I'm saying these things but I hope you see the spiritual implication. Because many of you are selling things without even knowing. You're losing certain positions spiritually without knowing. You're losing certain opportunities in the spirit without knowing. He says there is an evil disease common among men. He says the Lord gives to a man wealth. He gives him health. He says a man to whom God has given riches, wealth, honor. So that he wanteth nothing for his soul and all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof. But a stranger eateth it. He says this is vanity and it is an evil disease. Some people are not physically sick. Some people have things in their lives that were ordained for them but strangers are enjoying. 
Praise the Lord Jesus. That's an evil disease. It is not your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. And that is why I say tonight something must change for somebody in Jesus name. God has proved to you by scripture that a man can take birthright. That a man can affect birthright. That there are things you can do and change your position spiritually. Not because God has not ordained you for that position, but you do not know how to rule your spirit. You don't understand the principles that change the right. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible has shown many examples of rights changing. Positions changing. And why God has given us these examples in scripture is that you and I will appreciate in every example given down in scripture how you ought to behave spiritually. How you ought to respond to the spirit world. Because the Bible is very clear. The things you see were brought about by things which are not seen. Every physical self and result on your life is as a result of a spiritual experience. And if you know how to deal with the spiritual, you will indeed deal with the physical. These are things you might never find in any book that I'm telling you. Because I didn't read them anywhere. And I never had them from any man. I got them even as the Lord showed me. It's not boasting. I'm only telling you, they are that serious. They are that serious. These things are that serious. So take heed in the few things that I'm going to share. I'll give you an example of Abraham. In the story of Abraham. The Bible says in Genesis 21 verses 12. Ishmael was the son of Abraham. Isn't it? He was the firstborn of Abraham. Like I said, in the Hebrew, the Jewish culture, from olden days, even in scripture, the first son means something spiritually. And I'm going to show you a few examples in scripture of some of the people who lost their right and why. So you understand these principles. Now with the issue of Ishmael, Ishmael sorry, and Isaac. Isaac was the second born of Abraham. Ishmael was the first born of Abraham. Now, the Bible tells you very clearly, even in Deuteronomy, that in, when it comes to the inheritance of the first son, huh? I want you to understand this and note this because this is going to come back a bit later. When it comes to the inheritance of the first son, God has ordained that every first son receives a double portion. And to articulate that to mathematics, he receives two thirds of his father's inheritance. Two thirds. And the rest is supposed to be distributed to the rest of the siblings. But according to scripture and ancient history, it is not obvious that it is so. It is advisable, it is godly, it is divine, but it can change even if you are the firstborn. And I'm going to show you how it changes. Because again, we're talking about birthright. You understand what I'm saying? We're talking about birthright because you can't define blessing, inheritance, without understanding the birthright, the position. Because if, for example, a firstborn receives two double portion, right? The two thirds. If you're among the, the, the fourth and fifth, already your inheritance is defined. It's obvious that you can only get in the other third. If you're seven, the seven will get in the other third. That is why I pray to God I get the grace one day to share, to share what the Lord has shown me regarding generational blessing. Because the Bible says that a wise man lays up an inheritance for his children and his children's children. A good man leaveth inheritance to his children and his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. 
But it says that when it comes to the inheritance of a good man, he leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That means that the inheritance, the anointing, the blessing, everything, the finances, everything, it's not supposed to only end on your immediate children. It's supposed to go to your children's children. But in the practical sense, if you look at it from the practical sense, it looks literally impossible if, you th- if we do the math here. I'll give you an example. If I'm a man and I have seven children, right? And I have a billion dollars or seven billion dollars or seven million dollars, right? And I have seven sons or seven, four sons and three daughters. And I have seven million dollars. And I leave a million dollars to each of my sons. Are you hearing me? That means of the seven sons and daughters, four sons, three daughters, or three sons, four daughters, each child receives a million dollars. And each of those children that I have left with a million dollars produces ten children. Each of them. That would be seven times ten, which is seventy. If I get seven million dollars originally, then I gave a million to each, and each is supposed to also split that a million into ten of them. How much does each receive? Huh? Hundred thousand or something, right? Now, if those is that is that is that inheritance? It's already gone. That is why many many families sell inheritance after some time because it becomes too small for the grandchildren to share who has understood what I just said I pray to God I get the grace to explain to you how to effect your time those of you who will be alive watch my grandchildren you'll see you watch It's not what you live for them. It's what you live in them. It's the things you start to lay up in your children. That give you a surety. Of how your grandchildren will be. That's a good man. That's a good man. Are you following me? Abraham. Ishmael is the firstborn. Bible is very clear. But even though Ishmael. Is the firstborn. He does not receive the inheritance on the anointing of Abraham. Why? Very simple. In this instance, the firstborn has not received the birthright of inheritance because he is not the son of the promise. He is the human effort between Abraham and Sarah trying to fulfill the word of the promise upon their lives. He's a residue. He's a result of human effort to fulfill divine purpose. Isaac is the child of the promise. He comes out laughing. You understand? Ishmael weeps at one point. Ishmael comes weeping. But Isaac comes laughing. In fact, the Bible says he was named Isaac, meaning he laughs. And he says, in Isaac shall thine seed be called. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Genesis 12 to 1, 12, and God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bond woman and in all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thine seed be called. Did you, did you see that? Meaning, you can affect your place in the spirit every time you try to do human effort to fulfill the promise of God on your life. That is why we preach grace. Because grace is mandated to show you what God does in you and through you. That at the end of the day, every success, the grace, the glory, the purity, the righteousness, the peace, the joy, the, the, the everything that comes with the grace of God preached on your life. You can see from a back and know that it, it has nothing to do with your human effort. But it has everything to do with the operation of God's ability in your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. So one of the reasons why people affect or why people have are affected in the place they hold in the spirit. The position of inheritance is human effort to fulfill the promise. That was in Abraham. God took us into the generation of Isaac. 
the same thing happened. Esau was the firstborn. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jacob was the second born of Isaac, isn't it? Huh? Again, a similar situation happens. And the boy who is first, the brother takes his position. And then he becomes second in the spirit. Why? Because one day he comes from hunting. And then he comes home and he's hungry. Are you hearing me? And then he finds his brother. Then he asks him, I need some food. Give me some meat. Give me some pottage. I'm fainting. And the brother told him, I can only give you food if you will sell me this day your birthright. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says, also says, for what profit is the birthright to me? At this point, I'm going to die. Honestly, Esau was not going to die. Because the scriptures don't tell us that he had not eaten for many days. And the second reason why many people have an effect on their right in the spirit is the satisfaction of your appetites. Pleasure. Hallelujah. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. What am I trying to tell you? Watch your appetites. Hallelujah. Watch your appetites. Stop thinking that you have to satisfy every pleasure. Praise God. There is somebody whose life has gone into alcohol. Because of the satisfaction you find in alcohol, you are going to kill yourself. God forbid. Praise God. The children of Israel almost lost their place in the spirit because they were missing watermelons, leeks and onions and garlic. He says, for we remember the onions we ate, the leeks and garlic. Some of you, it's Storm, Freaky Freddy, Sleepy Willy. What business do you have with Shafiq? Come on, somebody. Praise God. Sometimes you have to say, uh uh, uh, no. For the hope that is set before me, hallelujah, I'll endure this cross. The Bible says, For when Jesus beheld the joy, that was set before him. Hallelujah. He endured the cross despising the shame. And he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand of precision. The right hand of honor. The right hand of, of approval. Why? Because when you see the joy set before you. Sometimes you make up the decision all the time. In fact. To say uh-uh, this is not worth it for my future. Somebody shout Hallelujah. Shafiq is not worth it. Guinness is not worth it. Somebody shout hallelujah. I was Esau. It goes in Jacob's life. And people still think it's a mistake. Hallelujah. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and 1. Jacob had children. But the Bible says, but his firstborn was who? Reuben. But the Bible says, he defiled his father's bed and slept with a father's maid called Bilhah. And what happened? And by the Bible says, the birthright was shifted and given to the lineage of Joseph. And the Bible is clear that the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. That means they could not count him in the genealogy 
as one with the birthright. That is why when they come from Jacob, scripturally and history, they skip to Joseph. They forget Reuben. Be careful what you do to your father. Let me say it again. Be careful what you do to your father. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. It goes from Jacob into Joseph's generation. Again it comes. Genesis 48. He brings his sons to Jacob, Israel. And he tells them, here are your children. Pray for them. Praise the Lord Jesus. And when he goes to verse 17, he says, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him and he held his father's hand and to remove it from him and, and to put it on Manasseh's head. Why? Because Manasseh was the firstborn and Ephraim was the second. But when they bring the child, the man crosses. And the Bible says, this man is like, no, I think it's because my father's eyes are closed. Let me tell you, no father is blind. They might appear like they are blind, but they are not blind. Sometimes patience with people means blindness to those people. Sometimes when a father is patient with you, you think he's blind on what you're doing. No. No true man of God and has the ability to father. No, not just the title, but has the ability to father is blind. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. That's why some of you, even in the dream, I call you and I tell you, come and see me on Friday. You get it? We're not blind. But here is a challenge. The Bible says, Joseph said unto his father, Not so my father, for this is the firstborn to put the right hand upon him. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. And the Bible tells us, Jacob was blind. But Israel could see. <laughs> Who has understood what I just said? Israel could what? And, and the Bible tells us Israel blessed. Jacob didn't bless. Israel blessed. Are you following me? She has a problem. And there's a challenge here again. I ask the Lord, okay, I can understand the issue of Reuben. I can understand the issue of Ishmael. I can understand the issue of Jacob and Esau. In fact, adding on the issue of Jacob, I also saw that there was a contribution of the, of the mother, Rebecca. That is why it's expedient for men if you should leave this earth first if possible leave your wife to that re responsibility. You might never understand it but it's scriptural because God speaks to your wives too. In the issue of Jacob do you know God spoke to Rebecca before even Isaac knew it? How many of you know that in the generation of David it also came back. I'll come back there and I'll show you the part. Anyway Let's first finish the issue of Joseph. Because I, I have got to understand the rest. But what did Ephraim do? What did Manasseh do? And the Spirit of the Lord told me, check out the Hebrew meaning of Ephraim and the Hebrew meaning of Manasseh. And when I checked out the Hebrew meaning of Ephraim, Ephraim means one who was blessed doubly. And Manasseh is translated as cause to forget cause to forget it means the forgotten one he got the firstborn and called him you you are the forgotten one and then got the second one and told him you are doubly blessed again the double blessing of the firstborn he named it on Ephraim and God had it that's why I'm saying be careful how you name your children stop giving your children dog names what is the meaning of Todd? Bolt. Oh, you know, Apostle, we can cleanse names. There are names you can't cleanse. How do you cleanse Samu Samoa? Those of you who don't understand Luganda, in, in English it sounds like the chief of demons. How do you cleanse the chief of demons? How do you call your child demon? Cleanse it, but it's called demon. But not that one of, of Satan, but the one of God. 
anything close. Some are not demon, they're called demon. Don't, what, don't, come on. We'll get lost in the semantics and call your child demon. Stop cutting them short. David is David, not devil. Because you, you'll make us think like you're talking about the devil. <laughs> and the Lord told me, the Lord told me, the challenge was the naming. A child's position in the spirit can be affected by the name they give. Somebody shout hallelujah. (laughs) Tell your neighbor it's important how you name children. Because you position them in the spirit. How you name your child positions them in the spirit. Who knows the meaning of Delilah? Go read it. You'll understand why she, she was responsible for the plucking of the man's eyes. It's the very reason why Solomon is, I mean, David was a father. His firstborn was Amnon. Amnon rep stammer. He looks at the character of the firstborn and he feels this one cannot continue the destiny of a kingdom. Now look at the other first sons of different women. Absalom. Absalom killed, killed Amnon. Adonijah. He claims position when the father is still alive. And she says, uh uh-uh. But God had chosen Solomon through the spirit of David. Why? Why? Solomon was like what? Like number five or something or four? Because David had had wives before. So why did he choose Solomon? To take over the seat. It was more than, you know, I used to think it was just a a consoling Bathsheba because she lost the firstborn. In fact, Solomon was the second son of Bathsheba. The first child died. And, and I was amazed that the name Bathsheba means daughter of Oath. That means that it was more than just the mother of Solomon and the wife to David. God had an oath with that woman. He had an oath with that woman. And if the Lord opens your eyes in the spirit, when I studied more, I understood why she had to mother the next king of Israel. And all of these things are happening. All of these examples. And you still can assume that it's a mistake. No. God is telling us something. All of these are principles. Somebody shout hallelujah. But back to the story. He comes in Colossians and he tells you that when Jesus comes in the dispensation of the New Testament, he becomes the firstborn from the dead. And the firstborn of all creatures. And he takes preeminence. And then it becomes the head of the body. Meaning that the double portion of the firstborn is upon the Christ. And because the double portion of the firstborn is upon the Christ. And you are the body of Christ. Anything outside that body. Get the other third. Ha ha ha. city. What am I trying to tell you? God revealed to me that if the wealth of the world is three parts, the church is supposed to possess two. Then the rest of the world possess the other one third. That's how we can learn to nations. Watch Fanero. Watch the members of Fanero. Watch the people who attend Fanero. The Lord spoke to me and told me in a few coming years, the biggest multimillionaires and billionaires on the earth are going to be in Fanero. This is beyond unbelief. This is beyond whether you believe me or you don't. God has never lied to me and I've never been wrong on the voice of the spirit. That same voice has been fulfilled every time when he spoke to us. If you've been with me for 10 years, you would know I don't make God speak. God is no man that he should lie. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have two thirds 
of everything you see on the face of the earth. And that is going to change in the mighty name of Jesus. Why do I say that? I'll explain why. It is a truth and research infallible that they have proved that the richest nation with the richest number of Christian faiths is the United States. Any other nation besides the United States that has been successful, has been successful, they say, because there is no Christianity. That means Christianity is where poor people are, on the exception of the United States. It's the only one place on the face of the earth where there are rich Christians. Re- I mean, not, not, not even in Uganda we are here, but I mean, <laughs> the United States has a number of Christians who are really rich, more than any nation has on the face of the earth. And on the contrary, they're showing that nations like China, which have chastised Christianity as the fastest growing, Belgium, Switzerland, guys who don't want to know about God, I don't know whether it was Denmark or Sweden, and I was reading one of them, they have about 57 churches in one nation. A whole nation has 57 churches. And then you, you go to Kinshasa and find 10,000 churches in Kinshasa. Sickness is there. Bondage is there. Death is there. Poverty is there. And I understood the problem. Birthright. We don't know. We sell it on the pulpit we sell it in our sermons we sell it in the way we respond to the things of the spirit and and now i want to talk to you as africans some of you live in africa and think it's the only place in the world africa is a continent there are other continents open your eyes and be exposed and see how people do things. If it's diligence, the Bible says, See as thou a man diligent with his work, he shall stand before kings and not before mean men. If it's excellence, be excellent. If it is reading, read. Somebody said, If you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. Give me that book, you'll see. I'll disprove you. But that has been a fact with many Africans, people of our own blood. But also there's a delusion with white people who think that all black people don't have brains. And for those ones, we are about to shock. We are about to shock. Why? He has been made our wisdom, our redemption and sanctification because in him is hid all treasures of wisdom. And guess what? He's in here. The only answer is in the gospel. And we are not teaching it. We are wasting people's time. People go to church and they just see theater. People are playing in the things of the spirit. People go to church like they are going for a witch doctor. What, what is God saying, man of God, on my life? Come on! What does your Bible say? You have a sure word of prophecy. You want me to tell you that next week you are going to get a car? What does the Bible say? Whether Paul or Apollos, whether Kephas thinks present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ. If the Bible has not given you a limitation to what you possess, why should I limit you to a car? When you're being blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly presence of Christ Jesus, when you're being given all things that pertain to life and godliness, this is the problem. We don't read the word. We don't invest in the word. Because in African tradition, all you knew was to go to a Musao, Muganda, Jeja, (laughs) Anyandoga. But who has understood what I just said? Saints, this is a generation that reads the word. This is a generation that listens to the word. They have it in their car. They have it in their their bedroom. They have it in their bathroom. It's on their phones. It's everywhere. They listen to it. They're confessing. They're speaking it. 
give us a few years. Africa is rising again. Somebody shout hallelujah. And I discovered one undeniable truth. That the foundation of that blessed nation America was on the word. It was not on fanaticism and excitement. It was on the word. That is why many of our people in Africa can't stand on certain American pulpits. Because they're just going to take theater. But that is changing. Somebody said hallelujah. Heal the sick but preach the word. Prophesy but preach the word. Sing songs but preach the word. Evangelize but preach the word. And not just the word. The real Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He became flesh. We beheld his only glory as the only true son of God full of grace and truth. And who was that? Jesus is the word. And he says if I, the word, be lifted up I will draw. People don't come to Fanero because they have nothing to do on Thursday. No. You come because you want to feed your spirit. Hey! You've prayed. You've been on prayer mountains. You've fasted. You've done everything. They prophesied, prophesied, evangelized, and nothing. Listen, there is one thing that cannot fail. He says heaven and earth shall pass away but my word he says by faith we understand that the worlds, the eons were created by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by things which do appear. If I have the same word that created the world how can I create my world? How can I create my ministry? How can I create my marriage? How can I create my children's brain? Tell your neighbor with all I'm getting get the word. He says, and we behold like in a mirror. Because the word of God is a mirror. The glory of God. What happens? We are transformed. We are metamorphosed. From one image of glory to another image of glory. To another image of glory. Even as by the spirit of the Lord. Ever increasing splendor. Ever increasing splendor. The just shall live by faith. I have a church member. She lives in Canada. One time she was swimming. And the doctors said, doctor said, she got a cardiac arrest. And the person she was swimming with, who is also a church member, one of our members in diaspora, he looks for the woman. After a couple of minutes, he's not seeing her. He thinks she's out. But then Sam tells him, you know what? Go swimming. Maybe she's under because he couldn't calculate how she could have left. He found the body underwater. Sunk in there for minutes. He gets the body and brings it on the, out, out of, a, of, of the swimming pool. And then he pumps, pumps. Nothing is coming out. No breath. No pulp. Nothing. The body is cold. It has been underwater for minutes. He's speaking in tongues. He says, you can't die. Man, the word of God, he can't die. You can't die. You can't die. Not now. No. And this lady said that in a vision, in a vision, it was like Satan appeared, something in form of a devil. And it came, held her hand, she could see it pulling her to take her. It was a spirit of death. She was out. She was not breathing for so long. I mean minutes and minutes. In fact, scientifically, they tell, they'll tell you that she was supposed to be brain dead because the body can't run without oxygen for a long time. But she says that while she was in there, she had me preaching to her. <laughs> While this guy was telling her you can't die, when the words are getting in her spirit, 
she, she sees Apostle Grace telling her, not, not now. Uh uh-uh. uh. You have things to do. You have things to do. You can't die now. The life of God is in you. The same life that raised Christ from the dead is residing. And the, the, the lady says, while, she, while, while I was preaching in there, she just jumped down and says, No! Oh, me! But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through Christ who strengthens us, the just shall live. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Tell your neighbor, get mad in the word. Africa is rising again. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, Africa is rising again. Africa is rising. Give it a few years. It will be the place, the destination. The answer for the world. Why? We got it. We got it. Let's stick on it. Rain has hit us when we are listening. The sun has been there when they are listening. We went on the streets preaching in taxis and buses, in trains and planes, and we stayed preaching it. Why? Because we know. We know what we are up to. We shall not be put to shame. That is why I told Christians, those of you who understand the spirit, it's time to fix this nation. It's time to fix this nation. Be serious. Africa will rise through men and women of God. He said you shall be the head and not the tail. Come on, raise your voice and start speaking to God. in this equation I refuse to be an ordinary person I'm in the double blessing because I'm the part of the body of the firstborn who takes preeminence in all things and has a duo double inheritance as a believer you have two times more than the best in the world There's gonna be a great way There's gonna be a great revival in the land There's gonna be a great awakening For everyone who calls see Jesus lifted high the banner that flies across the sky that all men may see the truth and know he is the way to heaven we want to see Jesus lifted high the banner that flies across the sky that all men may see the truth and know he's the way to heaven we're gonna see come on pray for your nation pray for your people if you're in, in, in the u.s pray for the u.s if if you're in canada pray for canada if you're in australia pray for australia if you're in dubai if you're in guatemala pray for your nation ugandans let's pray for uganda 
children need salvation they need a nation whose God is Jehovah not weed God give us Christian believers leaders in this nation men who fear your name men who bow to the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob who understand their responsibility God deliver this nation from emotionalism give us a revelation Uganda cannot be secular Africa cannot be secular Europe cannot be secular Jesus needs to come in and is coming in come on take your place believer what about you can't you rule this nation can't you lead God's people what about you what about you God bless you in ministries God bless you in the offices that a believer must stand that all men may see the truth and know he is the way to heaven somebody say in the mighty name of Jesus put up your hands say in the mighty name of Jesus I carry the birthright after the son of God I'm part of the body of the firstborn of all creatures and the firstborn from the dead I have a double inheritance I thank you God because you have made me meet to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light my finances the wisdom upon me my family my career my ministry they're all flowing in that blessing and wherever i am i shall be the change and the answer give the lord a mighty clap of praise clap like it has been done if you're sick touch why it's paining healing is taking place now receive your healing receive your healing receive your healing in the mighty name of Jesus even those evil diseases of frustrated potential oh I rebuke the spirit of poverty get out wherever you are go somebody has been struggling with that God delivers you from poverty and strife in Jesus name if you're here and you say today I want to receive that Jesus the firstborn he died for your sins he shed his blood for you he loves you more than the things that pursue you he has pursued you with an everlasting love and he wills that you have life eternal come and receive him as your lord and savior come and receive him Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want you to repeat these words after me and mean them from your heart. Mean them from your heart. Say, Jesus, tonight I respond. To your love 
for me. I walked here to proclaim your saving power and lordship over my life. I believe with my heart and I confess that you are the son of God that gave his life for me. Tonight, my life changes. I surrender my life to you. Change me. Use me. I'm available. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Venero, make manifest.